thankfully, much like February, April was a real good success for um, reading the books that I put on my TBR for the reasons, etc. Um, March was, we'll, 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 we'll not think about March, we'll not dwell there, but April was really good and I'm keen to now get on to talking about the books that I want to read for May. I've been wanting to do this theme now for quite a while and I planned um, to have done it at some point this year. I hadn't necessarily planned to have done it this month, but then um, at the start of April I saw something that made me think and made me contemplate and drove me to do this theme for this month. So the theme I'm going to be reading th for this month is sort of surrealist literature. I have got here a selection of six books which are interesting in how they kind of relate to the concept of surrealist literature. Now what drove me most to do this theme for this month was actually um, towards the start of the month I saw a tweet come up on my timeline um, and I shall read the tweet out and post um, a picture of it here. It says, I'm going to need everyone who talks about books to stop calling things magical realism. If it doesn't centralise a post-colonial perspective and critique of regimes, government and socio-political oppression, some magic in your white bread town doesn't make it magical realism. As with many things on Twitter, um, people put massive ideas into very small tweets, and I must say that the person who posted this did also have a little bit of a thread. Um, not that they ever kind of counted against um, what they were saying or kind of made the argument broader, but they did highlight something interesting, which was that sometimes publishers will use the term magical realism um, to make a book that's quite fantastical or a fantasy book seem a lot more literary. And I think that's a very fair um, thing that does happen and is very much a kind of push against the genre of fiction within the publishing industry. However, the first original tweet um, saying about what magical realism is, I felt I probably don't really agree with. Um, I can understand to an extent how in this time when cultural appropriation is like very much heightened, that many people who have the sort of the magical realist Latin American literature as part of their sort of literary heritage feeling a little bit uneasy when others sort of use this phrase to describe things which perhaps don't align, but I do think that saying a statement like this um, is quite a shame because first of all I think it causes a lot more divisions than unity. I do think it's al almost a little bit misguided um, perhaps because we don't have the additional words around it. To, to describe what magical realism is is a bit tricky of course, but I think in order to say that it is just um, centralising on post-colonial perspectives and critiquing regimes, governments and socio-political oppression, I think doesn't, doesn't do justice to the history that came before um, the concept of what magical realism as we know it now is. I mean, not once does this person ever say that magical realism is solely a um, Latin American genre. So, you know, it's, it's a bit hard to kind of break down that argument, but the way that it has been expressed um, makes it seem like that's what it is, because are things that are highly prescribed to predominantly the magical realism of Latin America. So surrealism, in a way, was part, not the soul movement, but part of the kind of helping of developing the concept of magical realism, and that surrealism was used by many in non-Western or non-white cultures to create um, a sort of a literary canon in which they are able to exist, um, which wasn't allowed to them previously in the concept of a very realist Western ideology of literature. So this, this whole sort of surrealism as a tool became, came out of like a discussion and came out of the sharing of culture between the European and the New World. A magical realism that developed in Latin America, which sort of critiques in these areas also came from quite a privileged voice within that context um, due to the fact that we're looking at authors and artists who 
had spent significant time in Europe, had spent time with authors and artists in Europe, and had kind of learned different things, different ways of thinking, um, much as we do today. The, we collaborate with all cultures around us, and sometimes it can lead to appropriation, but sometimes it can also lead to appreciation and development of newer cultures. So I wanted to kind of examine surrealist literature this month and kind of look at the fine line between surrealism, magical realism, fantasy, um, and kind of assess my thoughts a little bit further and a little bit more deeply on this topic. So the six books that I have got um, are kind of split into three piles. The first two books are strictly surrealist texts from surrealist authors who were part of the surrealist movement in Europe. The, the next two are ones that could be magical realist because one of them is a uh, Latin American book, um, the other is a, uh, is a French book um, which was praised by an author from the Ulipo movement um, who didn't necessarily use surrealism but use similar sort of traits from surrealism in their writing. So there's those ties. And then the final, and the next two books are from the Far East um, and are books that I think show how surrealism and magical realism are developing in different parts of the world and how different cultures are sort of changing the meaning of these genres. So, the first book I want to read is Leonora Carrington, The Hearing Trumpet. Leonora Carrington. Leonora Carrington was the lover of Max Ernst, who was part of the Surrealist Movement, and she also created her own artwork within the Surrealist Movement, and this is one of the stories that she produced from it. This, is, this follows um, an old person who, once receiving a hearing trumpet, can hear plots against her. And as she's put into this, like, sort of old people's home, um, she gets on these sort of surrealist, scandalous adventures. And then the next one is Andre Breton's Nadia. Now this book is a sort of obsessive um, part confession, part novel about a woman called Nadia who the narrator becomes obsessively in love with. Um, and it follows the narrator through his day-to-day -day experiences and this obsession, um, but creates it in a way that is contrasting images in a way that disrupts um, the way that we normally tend to think of these sort of stories. Both these books are very much strictly surrealist text. Andre Breton was almost like the founder, he wrote the manifestos for the surrealist movements, and so these will utilise the techniques which were pre predominantly um, created, such as automatic writing and contrasting the mundane um, in ways that disrupt sort of expectations um, and creating these odd images which are unsettling but also raise questions of our presumptions anyway. I've been wanting to read these books for a long time, so I'm finally glad to get around to them. And in the next two books, the first one is Mood Indigo by Boris Vian. Now this book is about a woman, it's been adapted into a film, of course, I haven't yet watched the film. But the woman, um, I believe she develops a, a lily or something that's growing in her lung, and the only way to sort of like keep her alive is for her husband to constantly provide flowers around her. Um, and it's a love story, but it's got this sort of twist to it, which um, has this strange imagery, which kind of you d would relate to the surrealist movement, but could be more magical realist, in that everything is real, and the, ma and the magic element isn't there to disrupt um, preconceived notions, but is there to, to help solidify a meaning, a greater meaning. This was blurred by Raymond Cuno, who was part of the Lippo movement. He never really was part of the Surrealist movement, but there are links between them, and you can see how in the Lippo movement, where they create sort of very strict rules to kind of push the boundaries of what literature could be, um, the Surrealist movements did very similar um, but with less strictness in their in their writing. Um, and I think there could be crossovers, and I'm really intrigued to see how this one kind of lies within that sort of grey area. And then I've got Sudden Death by Alvaro Enrique. Now this book is um, written by a Mexican author who grew up in the US, and it chronicles a tennis match happening in Europe between um, two very big figures from Italy and Spain, but then also the fall of the Aztec Empire under the sort of Spanish colonialism. And from, from as far as I'm aware, this book has um, really odd juxtapositions of images which disrupts your um, understanding of what's going on um, and makes you reconsider your thoughts. Um, so this one, just because of the author's background, um, the sort of the writing canon, which I guess this book is most akin to, 
um, could be seen as more magical realist, but from what it sounds like, it holds a lot more of the surrealist nature and what the surrealists like to see in their writing. And then the last two books, I've got a Japanese book and a Korean book. The Japanese book is um, Kobo Abe, um, The Woman in the Dunes now. This book is about a man who, I think he's hunting for beetles and he finds himself in a um, village that is half half buried by these sand dunes and then he find he finds that after spending a night there he has become imprisoned and he's almost used like a slave there now this one i believe i'm not whole, wholly convinced but i believe it does have some magical realist elements um to it and i think that this can really help to see how different parts of the world kind of take the concept of sort of literary genres that have been developing in other parts and kind of make it their own um, and I'm really interested to see how um, Kobo Abe has kind of used this in this book in particular because there's part of, parts of it which sound almost a bit Kafkaesque and, um, and I'm, I'm intrigued very much so. Um, I also find that Japanese literature, you know, we, we're getting Murakami and things but there are a lot more magical realist elements that are being developed within that literary canon um, that we're getting from over there and I think that's really exciting, um, especially contrasted with the really strict realist texts that are also very quirky and very um, have almost this feel of possibly being magical realism without actually ever really branching off into that sort of genre and that writing style. Um, so I'm intrigued to see how this one kind of fits into this sort of theme and what I can sort of make sense from it um, in regards to this topic. And then the last book is 100 Shadows by Huang Jun. Now this book is follows um, a couple in sort of an electronic slum in Seoul, I think. And, this, and in this building, the shadows of people um, begin to come to life on their own. And I think that's going to be like a really interesting examination on, um, on a part of culture and a part of society and how it has been developed through the use of something which we might deem a little bit more magical realist, but borders that line between the fantastical and the real. And I do believe that both these books as far as I'm aware, um, have some sort of sense of myth mythology to them. And I think the Surrealist movement um, at the time had this sort of really big notion about the use of mythology and storytelling of myths um, from other cultures um, in order to tell very human stories. So I'll be intrigued as to how um, that kind of element comes into play in these texts and how then they can both show a development of this sort of writing style, this genre, um, in different parts of the world. I'm very excited to read these books and I'm very excited to then consider further with a little bit more um, reading done my, my opinion on this topic, um, which is of course a massive topic and cannot be perhaps necessarily um, stated in just a tweet. So I'll see you next time for another video. Bye bye.